channels we can review. The tragic murder of two parents and three children in a West Bank settlement includes a three-month-old baby. How one agency is helping to feed the poor this holiday season. The next boxing match on the Jewish channel and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Five members of a Jewish family, including a baby and two young children, were stabbed to death in their sleep in the West Bank settlement of Itamar on Friday night. The attack was allegedly perpetrated by Palestinians from neighboring villages, and the Israel Defense Forces is currently investigating and rounding up suspects. The two murdered parents are Udi and Ruth Fogel. They were the parents of six children, three of whom died that night. Their 11-year-old son Yoav, their 3-year-old son Elad, and their 3-month-old daughter Hadass. All of them were stabbed to death in their sleep, some in the heart, some with the slashing of their throats. Three Fogel children are now orphans, and they survived the attack through simple circumstance. While their parents and three siblings were being murdered around them, two unnamed Fogel children, aged two and eight, were apparently not noticed by the assailants as they were sleeping in a side room. The Fogel's oldest daughter, 12-year-old Tamar, happened to be at a youth event during the attack and was the one who discovered the bodies of her family members upon returning home Friday night. Please be warned that the following 30 seconds contain graphic images of the victims as they were found by police. If you'd like to turn away from these images, we'll tell you when they're over. Four-year-old Elad was found on the floor of his bedroom. While he initially appears to be wearing a red shirt, a closer picture reveals it's a white shirt stained red with blood, his yarmulke next to his lifeless hand. Eleven-year-old Yoav was found on his bed. Father Udi was in bed lying next to his three-month-old daughter, Hadass, when both were stabbed. Those are the last of the graphic images we'll be showing. When the surviving children of the Fogel family found their murdered parents and siblings, their screams woke up the neighborhood. Neighbors responded to their screaming and gave them shelter. Their surviving eight-year-old daughter was found crying, Daddy, get up! Daddy, get up! These words were repeated in a speech delivered at a funeral held on Sunday by Israel's chief rabbi, Yonah Metzger. At the funeral, the family members were wrapped for burial, and speeches were delivered by a number of Israeli leaders in addition to Metzger, including the chief of staff for the Israel Defense Forces, Moshe Yaalon. Also speaking at the funeral were the father of Ruth Fogel, Yehuda ben Yishai, and the mother of Udi Fogel, Sila Fogel, eulogizing their children and grandchildren. It is estimated that as many as 20,000 people were in attendance at the funeral. In the investigation into the crimes, varying reports suggest the IDF is looking for either one or two individuals who slipped into the settlement of Itamar more than a half hour before committing the murders, and then left by foot. The Jerusalem Post described the process of the IDF investigation, saying, quote, as the attackers used knives rather than rifles or pistols, and because of other characteristics of the killings, the IDF believes it was not carried out by an organized terrorist infrastructure, but more likely was the work of one or two people who could, though, be affiliated with one of the larger Palestinian terrorist groups. The Fogel family was one of the Jewish families removed from Gaza by the Israeli government in 2005 as part of then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's policy of disengagement. Political controversy is arising from the murders as they took place in one of the West Bank settlements that many governments, including the United States, would like to see relinquished as part of the peace process. Shortly after the attacks, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced plans for new construction in the West Bank. The White House issued a statement hours after the attack saying, We condemn in the strongest possible terms the murder of five Israelis in a terrorist attack in the northern West Bank, and we offer our condolences to their loved ones and to the Israeli people. There is no possible justification for the killing of parents and children in their home. We call on the Palestinian Authority to unequivocally condemn this terrorist attack and for the perpetrators of this heinous crime to be held accountable. Palestinian leadership in the West Bank also condemned the murders. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas delivered a statement on Israel's public radio, saying in part, This act was abominable, inhuman, and immoral. Any person who has a sense of humanity would be pained and driven to tears by such sights. Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Salam Fayyad issued multiple condemnations of the attacks. He issued a statement through the Palestinian news agency Wafa, in which he declared his, quote, rejection and condemnation of all violence directed against civilians, regardless of who was behind it or the reason for it. As with any event in which Israelis are attacked, many in the Jewish community make a point of describing the mainstream media's response, suggesting that there's media bias in how much attention is paid to Israeli victims of terror, as opposed to what's seen as more attention paid to the so-called bad news about Israel. 
whether it's the construction of new homes in contested areas, activities in the Palestinian territories, or enforcement of blockades. This week, it has been genuinely difficult to find much reporting on the slaughter itself in American media sources. Of course, with massive events across the globe, from the Japanese earthquake to government squelched protests in Saudi Arabia, one would expect somewhat less attention to be paid to the murders in Itamar. However, when looking through major U.S. sources of news, one finds that there was suddenly a lot of room available to discuss Itamar when the announcement of new settlement construction was made. In the New York Times, the original story about the murders was a wire story containing 165 words. The settlement expansion story, however, merited several times more words with 775. In the Washington Post, the story of the murders was 399 words long, while there were three separate stories on settlement expansion consisting of 532 words, 745 words, and 439 words respectively. A similar situation could be found on CNN.com, where the story of the murders was 561 words long, but the settlement expansion story was nearly twice as long, with 1,061 words. And in a symbol of the right-left divide on media in Israel, the most significant attention paid to the murders this week seemed to come from far-right Fox News host Glenn Beck, who spoke about Itamar for more than five minutes on his hour-long show. Here's a clip. Maybe it's just because of the horrible tragedies that are happening in Japan that people aren't seeing it, but it is worth stopping for a moment and recognizing that the mother and father of six were butchered to death along with three of their six children. But perhaps the media themselves aren't the only ones paying relatively little attention to the murders in Itamar. Here at the Jewish Channel, we receive dozens if not hundreds of press releases from Jewish organizations in any given week. Since the murders took place Friday night, we've received press releases from major Jewish organizations on topics ranging from a controversial film being screened at the United Nations to the holiday of Purim. We received press releases on the topic of the murders in Itamar from only two, the Orthodox Union and the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. Moving on to the topic of the Jewish holiday of Purim taking place this weekend, charity and the giving of food are key traditions of the holiday, and Rebecca Winnig Friedman reports on one effort to make an impact. The Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty gave out kosher food packages for Purim at a distribution center in Kew Gardens Hills, Queens this week, with some help from New York City Council Speaker Christine Quinn and Councilman James Gennaro. Quinn said city government counts on the work of organizations like Met Council to feed New York's hungry. The truth is if we tried to deliver extra food to New Yorkers in a way that is culturally competent and sensitive to the diverse needs, we would fail as city government. We simply couldn't do it. That's why we need to support networks of organizations like this. And facilitating the work of Met Council are 60 distribution sites throughout New York City like this one at Kehilat Sephardim, the Bukharian Jewish center of Kew Gardens Hills, which, in addition to this special Tuesday morning Purim distribution, holds an emergency food pantry every Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday, catering to the local Bukharian immigrant population. We were established in 1990 when the massive exodus of people came, and what happened was that we wanted to make sure to help our community. And uh, if you're hungry, you're not thinking about feeding your soul. You want to feed your body. Perhaps that's why demand for kosher food assistance tends to increase before Jewish holidays like Purim, according to Met Council CEO William Rapfogel. But those in need can count on Met Council for food assistance the year round. No questions asked. We don't do any means testing. If somebody feels they need help and they're just not able to pay their bills, we will give them food. To hear from City Council Speaker Quinn about where food assistance programs like Met Council stand in the city budget, watch the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. There's a lot of news this week in the world of Orthodox Jewish boxing. Yuri Foreman lost by technical knockout after the seventh round of his comeback fight Saturday night after recovering from a knee injury nine months ago. But another Orthodox Jewish boxer is scheduled to fight just before Passover, and you'll be able to see the fight right here on the Jewish Channel. Christian Neen reports on Dimitri Salida's latest plans. Dimitri Salida was a busy man last week at Universal Boxing Gym, training and getting in shape for boxing camp up in Detroit, ahead of his April 13th fight against Jermaine White at Oceana Ballroom, a fight that will be broadcast exclusively on the Jewish Channel. Salida was also putting in time as a promoter, talking with some young fighters on the undercard of his fight. He also told me that he's happy to be co-headlining the event's card with Louis Colazzo, even though the two boxers briefly disagreed over what to call the show. He is uh, uh, really one of the best fighters in boxing in junior middleweight welterweight division, and Louis hasn't fought in about two years uh, because he had uh, some uh, contractual problems that he was tied up with. 
and uh, he's coming back, so he wanted to name the card Redemption. I was like, Louie, man, you know, Redemption happened September 1st, so we can't do Redemption again. So, in honor of Jewish observance, the two fighters and trainer Nermo Lorik are dubbing the match Exodus. My Passover is coming. It's Exodus. So, ex so Exodus it was, you know, Louie Louis and I know each other for a long time, and, uh, you know, uh, him, him, Louis, Norma, and I sat together, and uh, and exit as it was. And after knocking out James Weka on TJC in December, and winning in a decision over Franklin Gonzalez on TJC in September, what does Salida think of his very busy fight schedule? It's it's good, you know. I haven't fought three three times in a row in, in a span of eight months since very early in my career, so uh, it's very good to be back in the ring so often. Uh, it's helping me sharpen my skills. I think from the first fight to the second fight, people were able to see. Uh, how much sharper I got. And Salida's trainer, Nermo Lorik, agreed. I think he's feeling better in the ring and he's getting sharper. So, And I think this fight here, the first fight, you remember, he was coming back from a long layoff. You know, he was fighting weight instead of fighting the fight. The second fight, he was on target. His weight was there. He trained real hard. And hopefully in this fight, it's the same. You know, we've been going through the same thing. He's not overweight. He's been on target where we, you know, good fighters stay at 10 pounds and 11 pounds over their weight. You know, and um, he's been eating good. I know he has. And now he has an inspiration. I told him in the morning, when you wake up, you look at your daughter, you know you got to go to work. To hear more from Dimitri Salida about his upcoming fight on April 13th, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. While much of the United States is engaged in a discussion of labor issues in Wisconsin and elsewhere, there's news in Israel's labor movement. And Rebecca Honig Friedman has that story. As social workers in Israel were striking last week, the chairman of Israel's organization of trade unions, the Histadrut, was in New York addressing Jewish community leaders at a briefing organized by the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations and the World Jewish Congress. Speaking in Hebrew, Ofer Aini briefed American Jewish organizational leaders on the warm relationship and collaboration between the Histadrut and the Palestinian General Federation of Trade Unions, or PGFTU. He said that these cooperative efforts between the Israeli and Palestinian labor unions could be, quote, a bridge to peace, and called PGFTU's Secretary General, quote, a partner for good relations. Aini also stressed the need to oppose the International Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement Against Israel, or BDS, noting the resolution calling for a full boycott of Israel as an apartheid state that was submitted to and ultimately rejected by the International Trade Union Confederation, or ITUC. Aini spoke of his efforts to educate the various members of the ITUC, of which he is now vice president, about the detrimental effects boycotts would have on Palestinian workers, who, thanks to efforts by the Histadrut, are increasingly integrated into the Israeli economy. Martin Schwartz, the executive director of the Jewish Labor Committee, which helped facilitate meetings between Aini and the president of America's union movement, the AFL-CIO, said it was important for labor unions around the world to hear Aini's message. Uh, the, the importance is engagement, not disengagement. Um, that calling for disinvestment, boycott, sanctions of Israel sounds um, like the right thing to do if you think it will move the peace process in the right direction. But in actually, it's the reality is that we know it's counterproductive, that it'll create situations where Israelis and Palestinians won't be able to work together when they already are. To hear more about Ofer Aini and the Histadrut, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Iowa Optimum Cable Channel 291, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, RCN Channel 268, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and Cox Cable Channel 1. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.